And good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I say again, we could be better than that. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Such a joy and a privilege to be with you all today here at Laboratory Presentation Church. Take a moment. I know we have to stay socially distant, but take a moment. Let's stand, say something nice, bless those around you. Let's greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. I really do appreciate those of you that are living into the queen wave in these difficult times. That's good. That's good. Just a few announcements before we begin today. Uh, immediately following worship today, we're going to have a congregational meeting. Uh, so if you're a member here at Laboratory, we invite you to stick around. It'll be a short one. We have uh, two nominees for the nominating committee, which I argue is the most Presbyterian thing you can say. And we need to amend our bylaws uh, to allow the session to vote uh, over Zoom, to meet and vote over Zoom. So we'll be doing that. Uh, also, looking ahead a little bit, All Saints Sunday and Veterans Day are both on their way, and TJ has graciously agreed to put together some slideshows uh, to honor each other in those seasons. So if you have photographs that you would like to get in, please uh, note that information in your bulletin. That would be great. September 13th is also coming, and that is going to be a big day in the life of the church. We're going to have an installation service. Uh, which sounds like something that comes with power tools, but is actually the Presbyterian way to uh, formally install a pastor. Uh, so it'd be, it would just mean the world to me if you could all be there for that. It's going to be a good time. Uh, and also that evening, the JLTM youth group begins its regular meetings after torturing their pastor at our adventure park. <laughs> Lots of other stuff is going on, but for now, will you prepare your hearts for worship and join me in our call to worship? The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded the seas and established the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, they give not let their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. Let us come and worship God. Will you join me in prayer? God of light and truth, you are beyond our grasp or conceiving. Before the brightness of your presence, the angels veil their faces. With lowly reverence and adoring love, we acclaim your glory and sing your praise. For you have shown us your truth and love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. You please stand for our time of confession this morning. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So let us in freedom confess the wrong we have done in our unison prayer of confession, followed by a time of silent personal confession. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. in all his deeds. The Lord upholds those who are falling and raises up those who are bowed down. My friends, believe this good news and give thanks. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, thanks be to God. God.
So good to see you, the young and the young at heart here this morning. I have a question for my children, friend, gathered around the room. What makes you afraid? What are the things we're afraid of? Anybody have anything they're afraid of? Speaking. Speaking publicly. It's yeah. interesting. All right. Yes, sir. Speaking in front of large crowds. Speaking in front of large crowds. Good. Yes. Snakes. Snakes. Yeah. Can I get it? Amen. Yeah. There are lots of things that keep us afraid. Uh, one of the best things that we can do as followers of Jesus is to be honest about the things that we're afraid of and to take those to Jesus in prayer. So right now, take a minute, close your eyes. Try and imagine something that's scary or that's frightening. And let's join together in prayer and give that scary thing to Jesus. Ready? Gracious Lord, we do give you thanks for this day and for these little ones. God, for all these things that we're picturing now, all the things that we're most afraid of, God, we give them to you. Because we know that you are strong, that you are mighty, and you are bigger than anything we are afraid of. So God, take these fears and be with us. Draw near to us and give us peace and hope in our souls. It's in Jesus' name that everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
scripture lesson this morning is a familiar passage, and when we come across familiar passages, it's a good idea to try to see and hear with new eyes. So let's listen for what the Lord has to say to us today from the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with them. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're continuing our series on questions. This is our fourth week. And as we keep going, I keep thinking that each subsequent question is more and more important, not just to these disciples, but to our own current culture in this moment. And today is absolutely no exception. But before we start with the question, I, I, I want to start with a different question that's been on my mind over the years. Before the pandemic came around back in those days, at my old church, my senior pastor and I would sneak out towards the end of the sermon writing process and get some work done outside the office. I haven't been around laboratory long enough to know what my new place is going to be. Krispy Kreme is strong in the running. But we had very specific names for these sermon writing places. We called them the branch office. We'd sneak out to the branch office. His was on the Panera on 19. Mine was the Dunkin' Donuts over by my house. And, and there were requirements for each branch campus uh, for both of us. You had to have ready access to coffee, good Wi-Fi, lots and lots of coffee, a low likelihood that someone would bump into you and interrupt your sermon, and, and as much coffee as humanly possible at the branch office. That's a lot of coffee. But even as I lived into this branch campus idea, there were requirements of me. There were things that a branch campus needed to have and, and something that I needed to have. I needed to make sure I had everything with me in the bag that I was carrying that day. A laptop and a charger, to be sure. A pair of headphones, absolutely vital. A Bible, which is only slightly less vital than the headphones because you can look up the Bible on the computer. You're all set. Pens and pencils to make notes on napkins, the adapters, plugs, chargers, dongles, and other knickknacks that you might need in case somebody wanted to download something from my computer. Full-size wireless keyboard because who could possibly sit hunched over a laptop that long? Cup for the coffee, save the environment a little bit. And at several points in time, anybody know these? The pinky ball? These are the best balls on the planet. This is sermon writing, pacing, Trying to get creative ideas out. Please pray for Paula as she shares the office next time. You want to make sure when you went to the branch campus that you have anything you could possibly need. You want to be prepared for every eventuality. Interesting that at the start of this story in Mark, Jesus wouldn't have passed my preparedness test at all. He has spent all of Mark chapter 4 teaching. Some big, huge crowds, so Jesus gets into a boat and pushes out a little bit from the shore so that everybody can see him. And while he's teaching, in this particular chapter, he does some of his greatest hits. The parable of the sower, the lamp on the stand. We get this little light of mine from here, right? Parable of the growing seed, parable of the mustard seed. He was really into an agriculture kick at that point, I guess. So at this point in Mark, Jesus has gotten pretty tired. So he says to the guys, Let, let's go to the other side of the lake. Let's relax a little bit. And the texts tell us that Jesus takes, or the disciples take Jesus just as he was in that moment. He finishes teaching and he leaves. No emergency bag, no tool belt, wasn't any way prepared for what comes next. None of them were. Almost right away it feels like in this text the storm shows up. So big that the waves are crashing over the side of the boat. And, and this is not uncommon in this particular region. The lake sits right in the just right meteorological situation that they get storms all the time. But even still, this one must have been a doozy. 
Remember that these disciples in question are professional fishermen. Some of them have been working on this lake for all their lives. I'm sure they've seen storms on this lake before. I'm sure these guys were hard men. I'm sure it takes more than a couple of raindrops and some big waves to get under their skin, and this one has them terrified. Must have been a big storm. You should also note that these were not big boats. If you look online about the kinds of fisher boats that these disciples would have used, they're pretty small. John Panett, a comedian I listened to, once said that anything that doesn't have a buffet and a casino isn't seaworthy. I tend to agree. Yeah. Tiny little rowboat. Big, huge storms. The waves are crashing. Storms come. They always come, don't they? And for his part in the middle of recreating the deadliest catch, Jesus is asleep on a cushion. I absolutely love this. Jesus is human. For all the attention and effort we put into rightly proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we see a Jesus who, after a whole Sunday's worth of preaching, needs a nap. Never related to my Savior more than in this moment. <laughs> but still, if you're the disciples, this is troubling behavior, isn't it? Where do you get the confidence to sleep during a once-in-a-generation storm? Where do you get that confidence? And at this point, the disciples have had enough. They get Jesus up, they wake him up, and they have a question for him. Don't you care? that we're drowning. Don't you care? Let's get real for a moment. Who among us hasn't had a season of, of crisis where this question hasn't come to mind? Who among us hasn't been standing at the deathbed of someone far too young and said, Jesus, don't you care about this person? Who among us hasn't watched a friend or a family member in the grips or throes of addiction saying, Jesus, don't you care? about this soul? Who among us hasn't looked around at the incredible death toll caused by this virus, the small businesses that are suffering, the decisions that we are constantly making, racial divisions that are going on each and every day, and the way that each and every one of the things I just named impact the life of a congregation here? Isn't it reasonable to ask, Jesus, don't you care about us? And I want to be clear here, in this series, sometimes we, we know that Jesus points us in the direction of better questions. But asking Jesus if he cares about us may not be the best question, but it's never wrong to ask it. I think it's a question most often born of legitimate crisis, and it's in those moments that Jesus wants to hear from us most and give us reassurance to the answer. So instead of answering their question, they ask, don't you care? Jesus just gets up, and he says to the waves, be still, peace, and they do. Now, we're here about miracles. There, there are some who have a hard time with miracle stories in the Bible. There are some who just want to be pragmatic and say, this isn't the way the world works. If I go to the beach and command the waves to stop, I think I'll end up with sand in my shorts. But there are also some who want to discount miracles because they have been in the moment of crisis, they have prayed for a miracle just like this, and the miracle never came. And I don't have much of an answer there. I don't know why miracles happen sometimes and other times they don't. But on a bigger picture, I believe that miracles have much more to say about who Jesus is than they do with who we are or what we might need. Up until this point in Scripture, the only one who was able to control wind and waves and nature was God. Mark is making a very specific point here. Jesus performs miracles because for as much as he is completely the kind of human that would fall asleep after a long day in the pulpit, he is also completely the God who can control the wind and the waves. Fully human, fully God. Miracles, both those attested to in Scripture and the ones that you and I have encountered in our lives, point us to the person of Jesus Christ. And if they don't do that, they're no better than playing a cosmic slot machine. Miracles point us in the way of Jesus. So after this miracle, Jesus turns to his disciples and has a question for them. Why are you so afraid? You still have no faith. Fear is a funny thing. What are you afraid of? 
Google it. In America, the number one fear among adults is public speaking. Number two is death. That means that at any given funeral, <laughs> most of the people in attendance would rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy. <laughs> Some people have a paralyzing fear of flying, getting on an airplane and flying. Some people are afraid they haven't saved enough and won't have enough money in retirement. Some are afraid of snakes. Some of us have an incredible fear of anything having to do with a needle. Fear is a very, very funny thing. I am deathly afraid of needles. I don't want anything to do with needles. My wife, who has had medical issues her life and has had more pricks and pokes and prods in it, rolls her eyes any time I have to go get blood work done. How could you be afraid of that? How could you possibly be afraid of that? Meanwhile, I stand and speak in front of crowds all the time. I've never feared the tax. Sometimes I fear what people will think of what I'm saying, but that's a different thing altogether. Everybody has different fears. And the things that make one person afraid may be no big deal to others. What are you afraid of? And how do you respond to fear? A couple strategies come to mind. Avoidance. One way to get over fear is to never encounter it. When I was a boy, I used to go to swim lessons. And this was a brutal time where they, you know, if you were afraid of going underwater, they would just like take you and drown you, essentially, and pick you back up and say, see, that wasn't so bad. So one day, my dad was working, my grandfather took me to the swim lesson, and I had a brilliant idea. I was just going to hide in the locker room and hope that he didn't notice I wasn't there. <laughs> Pat came in and gave me a speech that still rings true to this day. It's a thought that crosses my mind all the time. No one ever got anywhere by hiding. No one ever got anywhere by hiding. Because the truth is, I know at least for me, I still do that. I know I avoid conflicts because I'm afraid of offending people. I know that I punt on some serious conversations because I'm afraid of what people will think of me. I know that it's going to take a team of oxen to drag me to get my flu shot this year. But we also know this isn't a viable strategy, is it? We can hide all we want, but the things that we're afraid of will still be waiting for us. You can't ignore the wind and the waves. They're going to have to be dealt with eventually. Another thing some people do is to minimize their fears. We try and get over our fears by trying to pretend that the thing we're afraid of isn't so bad. And actually, truth be told, I see this more as a move to get other people to be less afraid, not ourselves. Imagine Peter turning to Thomas on the boat and saying, Oh, come on, buck up, soldier. These aren't such big waves, are they? Or imagine someone saying to another person wearing a mask that you shouldn't be afraid of a virus. Sometimes there are things that are smaller problems than we give them credit for, but a lot of times the fears that we carry are extremely real. The wind and the waves for the disciples, that was a real threat. You can minimize it all you want, but the threat was very real, and so was the fear. And it certainly almost never helps when we're minimizing someone else's fear, as if we knew how they were experiencing it. Me telling somebody that I've never been killed speaking publicly probably isn't going to help their fear. It's not going to help. Third thing some people do is to have overconfidence, to be overly confident. I knew a youth pastor many moons ago who every time we were together would just brag about how good a speaker he was. I'm the best. I've won awards. I have plaques. I'm the best speaker ever. And, and he would even find a way to sneak it into the conversation when it didn't belong. Have you met those people before? Hey, did you see the Penguin game last night? Oh, I didn't get to catch it till the third period because I was working on my lesson for youth group that night, which I'm really good at. But then the predictable end came about. There was a youth event, and we were all there, and he was a speaker. And between the pacing and the stuttering and the flop sweat, and you could see that every ounce of overconfidence he was pouring out in front of us was a cover. He was terrified. Our own attempts at overconfidence may convince others that we're not afraid for a little while, but they'll do little to help us when the bill comes due and our fears finally show up. What are you afraid of? How do you deal with your fears? These are questions that we ask each other and ourselves all the time, but you'll know it's not the question Jesus asked. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Why? 
Does Jesus care about us? Of course he does. Of course he does. Any religion or institution which doesn't make it plainly obvious that Jesus cares, loves for, welcomes, and embraces each of us hasn't been doing its job. Jesus absolutely cares for us, particularly in the moments of big crisis. And even in the little ones, too. And of course, Jesus is strong enough. What could possibly come to us in our lives that Jesus isn't big enough to handle? Stressful jobs? Potty training toddlers? Not that that's any relevance to my life at all. Caring for aging parents? Economic downturns? Pandemics? If even the wind and the waves obey the Son of God, then so will our calendars and our schedules and our bank accounts and our work lives and our futures. And if all that's true, Jesus cares for us, Jesus loves us, then why are we afraid? A couple ideas. We're afraid because we live in a culture of fear. One of the worst things that I think has happened to our culture is the advent of the 24-hour news channel. And this is a non-partisan statement. Pick any 24-hour news channel, it'll be the same. The reality of their business is that they need to bring eyeballs to advertisers, and one of the best ways to do that is to stoke fear. It's one of the reasons that it's so impossibly hard to find good news stories on any network now. It doesn't sell. It's fear sells. So I've been trying my own little personal experiment this week. Maybe you want to play along. As a news junkie, this was hard. I haven't watched news at all in three weeks. I've read from some balanced sources, but, but no more news channels, no more panels, no more breaking stories. I gotta tell you, it's liberating. It's liberating to step out of that culture of fear. And not for nothing in the middle of election year, but politicians of all stripes and of all parties have discovered they can win votes with fear. We owe it to ourselves when we're staring down our fears to ask, who is it that has a vested interest in keeping us afraid? Who is it that benefits from my actions or my inaction due to fear? Who profits from my fear? Is this something to be afraid of or is this oversold hype? Another reason we can be afraid is because we don't keep our eyes on Jesus. It isn't enough to cut out the things that are keeping us afraid. We've all heard the story of Peter walking on water, haven't we? And it's a miracle enough that Jesus can walk on water, but he invites Peter, a normal guy, out of the boat to walk with him. And while I believe deep in my bones 100% that this is a real event that took place, it also serves as a fitting metaphor that Peter doesn't, stop, or doesn't start sinking until he takes his eyes off Jesus. Imagine what we could do if instead of putting our eyes on our favorite news channel, put our eyes on Jesus. Imagine what we could do if instead of putting our eyes on our Amazon shopping account, we could put our eyes on Jesus. Imagine what we could do if instead of minimizing the things that we are afraid of, we put our eyes on Jesus and let him carry our fears. Keeping our eyes on Jesus is a daily practice. One of my favorite questions, you will likely hear me ask it of you, is what is Jesus up to in your life? What's Jesus up to? in your life. We need to work each and every day to name an answer to that question, particularly when things are going well, so that we're prepared for when they're not. Keep our eyes on Jesus. And the third reason that we get so afraid sometimes, I think, is because we don't trust Jesus enough. In fact, at the end of the story, Jesus has a two-part question, and the second part is the answer. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith. Faith is central to Christian living, yet it's something we don't often talk about. Faith is so much more than knowledge. It's so much bigger than belief. It's beyond religion. Faith, in fact, is trust. Faith is putting our money where our mouths are. Faith is putting boots on the ground of our belief. Faith is action and involvement and progress. To have faith in Jesus is to trust Him above all things. To have faith in Jesus is to trust Him rather than our bank account. To have faith in Jesus is to trust Him and not our politicians or our leaders to ease our fears about our nation. 
To have faith in Jesus is to trust Him and not our own abilities to save us from sinking and to provide our healing. The thing that Jesus is asking us to have trust in what the disciples doubted. Don't you care about us? Jesus cares so very deeply for each and every one of us. I've heard from more than a few folks in my life when they have a problem that Jesus must have better things to do than to deal with me. I mean, there are people suffering way worse than I am. I, I, he has a need to deal with me. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus cares about every aspect and dimension in our lives. We need to trust and to care in that love. Towards the end, Jesus says, why were you afraid? And the Greek word sounds a bit like John Wayne saying, you yellow belly cowards. Why are you so cowardly? But then as the disciples step back from the miracle, the text says they were terrified. It's a different word. It's phobeto. And it's a fear, but it's a respectful fear. It's like when you walk into a cathedral and see the big ceilings and it takes your breath away. Our trust in Jesus moves us from cowardly fear to respecting the power that Jesus has. We don't avoid the waves and the wind because that's not how we grow. We don't pretend that the wind and the waves aren't so bad because sometimes they really are. We don't lean into our own confidence in an attempt to project our own sufficiency. We don't eliminate our fears. We work through them by respecting the power of a risen, active, reigning, and caring Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God of grace, we give you thanks for this day, for this gathering, for this time of worship together. God, we come before you sometimes a bit too afraid. God, our world stokes fears. We carry fears for ourselves and our others, for our loved ones. God, we are praying this morning for boldness, to trust, to have faith in your love and in your care for us. God, grant us courage in these days. Help us to keep our eyes set firmly on you. Be with us, Lord. And as we pray in Jesus' name, everybody said.
each of us as a church family together in prayer. So I would ask, are there any joys or concerns that we could share together? Oh my goodness, it was like you were going to jump out of your seat yeah. with the excitement. Um, best wishes for my son, my daughter, my son, and his son-in-law on their marriage yesterday. Congratulations. Who's that? Paul Mayer. Here's for Linda Britko. She's one of our senior members and she has some ongoing issues, health issues. so kind as well. My next door neighbor growing up, a guy by the name of Rich, uh, contracted COVID and is in the ICU this weekend. So prayers for Rich and his family. People of God, let's go before the Lord in prayer. God of grace, we do again give you thanks. We begin with grateful hearts. God, for all that you've given us, for all that you continue to shower upon us. God, we give you thanks for the joys in our life, God, for weddings, for Darlene's daughter's wedding, God, that it was a joyful event. God, we pray that you would bless their union, uh, that you would continue to be with them, to guide them, to nurture them in this new life they embark on together. God, this day we give you thanks uh, for all those who teach, for all those who work in schools in this very unique time. God, as those are who are working to provide for our children's education are struggling with decisions that they never thought they'd have to make. God, we pray that you would give them wisdom, give them insight, you would give them courage in these days. God, we pray for those in our midst who need to feel your touch in a special way, who need healing and restoration from you. God, we pray for April. We pray for Betty and David Stammerjohn. God, we pray for Linda, for Ed, and for Rich. God, as those who are nearest to us are struggling with health, with illness, with injury. God, for those in the community that are just struggling with loneliness in these difficult days. God, we pray for your presence, for a peace that passes all understanding. God, be with the doctors and the nurses and the medical staff. May they help each and every one to heal, to find wholeness, to find restoration in you. God, we pray for our nation, for our leaders, Lord, for our president, for our legislators, for our judiciary. God, help these men and women to make choices full of wisdom and truth. God, be with those all around the world shudder to speak your name. God, may your good news spread from this place like wildfire. May all come to know the peace and the grace and the truth and the acceptance and the love of Jesus Christ. May everyone know how much you deeply care for each and every one of your children. God, we thank you that you do care for us, that you draw near to us to hear when we lift up these prayers. Right now, Lord, we continue by praying the prayer that your Son taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. So we're going to have a benediction. We're going to have a post leave. And if you are unable to stay, we understand, but we hope everybody will stick around for a congregational meeting shortly after. Sound good? My brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing in all the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to our doors. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Thank you.